Good morning, everyone. I, I know you're out there under these lights somewhere. So uh, thank you all for joining us, particularly early on a Monday morning. Note to self, do not schedule Monday morning conferences unless you have to. <laughs> I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. I have the pleasure of welcoming you today, getting us started. Uh, for those of you traveling to UNLV, welcome to campus. Uh, for all of you, welcome to the Greenspun College of Urban Affairs and uh, this great facility today. We uh, have many special guests, but I'm only going to acknowledge one, and that's our boss. Uh, Executive Vice Pro uh, President and Provost Diane Chase is here. I hope you all picked up the uh, agenda that's out front. We can get you copies if you didn't. Uh, just to summarize quickly, we're not big on long introductions here, uh, so bios of our speakers are presented. We'll just give them brief uh, introductions and get on with our business. You'll have three PowerPoint presentations today. That's the minimum uh, allowed at any academic conference, so uh, feel you're lucky. Uh, as I speak, all three of these PowerPoints are being uh, loaded on our website. So do not hurt yourself taking notes uh, on any uh, images or pieces of information. You'll be able to refer to those. We'll confirm that at the end of the day, as well as a couple handouts. Uh, we'll have a uh, handout that relates to my colleague Rob Lang's presentation, and also a longer version of Paul Umbaugh's presentation. And in a few days, we'll have Professor Jay Wan Lim's presentation up as well. Uh, so uh, we'll announce those, be looking for those. Uh, as you can see, we're recording the event, so if not by the end of the week, early next week, the, the video of our presentation will be here for any of you who want to help advertise and refer others to what we're covering today. Let me uh, just say in, in my closing that UNLV and the School of Medicine are about to embark on one of the most important contributions that a, a university and a med school can make to a community, and we all want to do everything we can to make it right, and that's the spirit of our presentations today. So let's get started with my colleague, Rob Lang. I think I got this. Oh, there you go. You're right, it's bright up here, Bill. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm kicking off this uh, symposium or colloquium, or whatever we call it, you know, whatever the academic name we've, we've latched onto this this morning, by looking at the origin and evolution of the med school. And uh, on the front, you, it looks like I'm presenting Virginia Tech or University of Central Florida's med school. Uh, I'm not. The reason they're up there is just to remind people that they've in one way or another inspired us. I was at Virginia Tech when the med school got done. And I learned from Virginia Tech how to do the kind of calculation of return on investment to the state tax revenue. Whether or not a million people was enough of a catchment area for medical education, for example. Those were things that Virginia Tech was discussing. University of Central Florida from the beginning has been kind of the most comparable region and probably the most comparable med school to us. Uh, we had Deb German, the dean, come and speak at the second conference we did on the med school. Uh, she was uh, the one that came up with the idea of funding everybody on scholarship, for example, uh, in the first several years to get the, the med school really launched. The political way that Orlando won its med school is, to be honest, something that Brookings and Lindsay copied completely. You know, going to the Chamber of Commerce, having them go to the legislature, ignoring the university regents, just sort of forcing it onto the system politically by using the strong arm of the, you know, the leading businesses in the region and having that reflected through the political process by having them capture the legislative branch and doing forums on it. And I'll describe those as we go through the timeline. The timeline I'm going to do, by the way, is mostly politics and funding. It's not this sort of academic timeline for the school. So at first, a disclaimer. I have to put this at every talk. If you don't like what I'm saying, yell at me. Don't yell at anyone else, yell at me. I'm available to be yelled at continuously. <laughs> I like to actually be yelled at. And, you know, by the way, the faculty are supposed to be like me. 
They're supposed to be, you know, look at Satan up there, I see, uh, <laughs> from Animal House. They're supposed to be kind of troublemakers. That's what tenure's for. It's not so that you can go into early retirement, although some take it that way. Uh, it's that you're protected from having unpopular opinions. And sometimes your opinions begin unpopular and then they become popular later on. So, you know, uh, faculty are important to stir that pot. And if, you know, as I say here, if Nevada can't handle that, we're in real serious trouble. And I think we can. And by the way, from the beginning, I've always either been getting educated at or within a, a state university that's a land grant, like this one is, as a matter of fact. And those schools are supposed to be outreach universities and do public service. And that's what ends up getting you into controversy. When the university, in its highfalutin airs, decides to venture into the sphere outside the, the sort of walls of the compound of the university, and some people start freaking out. So uh, background on me, just quickly. I'm director of uh, Lindsay and Brookings. I'm a fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington. I'm in this college faculty. And before that, I was actually at Virginia Tech, as I mentioned previously. And while I was there, I was in urban planning. And I was the director of the planning program for a while. I ran something called the Metropolitan Institute. I've been in this game a while. Uh, and when I was in Virginia, I did similar things to what I did in Nevada, which is I worked on all kinds of issues there, including transportation and economic development were the two major things. As a land grant, that's what they wanted from us. OK, so in this talk is a timeline. And as I mentioned, the timeline for me, the relevant part for me, is the section on the politics and the funding and what's gone on through you know, the last couple of decades on that. Uh, I'm not as concerned with you know, wh whether or not we were successful for LCME, because we've got the dean of the med school there, and she was successful in that. That's not really my charge. I'm not a physician. And um, you know, somebody who's uh, interested in the med school for economic development terms, which ends up being the way we really sold it. Uh, but it's not something where you know, I'm going to go practice medicine, thankfully. The general public can rest assured of that. And then I do a quick analysis. I, that would, first off, be illegal, I believe. A uh, quick analysis of uh, a missing piece of technology I have a personal history with uh, in Las Vegas. And I'll use that as a kind of metaphor for a lot of the fact that you know, I, we seem to be sort of the world's largest rural market for medicine. We don't appear like an urban market in some ways, and this is one of the categories where that's true. And I go, I go into analysis as to why that's true. Uh, so 2005, again, this doesn't include the time before time, you know, but before 2005. People were talking about med school. They were talking about med school for years. As soon as a region gets a million people, there's often discussion of a med school and an IKEA and professional sports and a whole bunch of things that reflect urban scale. So the border regions in... Uh, 2005, interestingly, passed a 20-year moratorium on new professional education. And we, at Nevada, if anybody recalls 2005, that was the middle of the last boom. We were the fastest growing state at that point. I was out here on a book project, and it was looking at development. And every mayor I talked to, everybody I spoke to in the development community at that point were all, this is going to happen forever, boom, boom, boom. And the budget that year, by the way, came in high from the state. And there was extra resources to put into the school. I'll mention that in a second. Uh, you know, that the regions take this vote at the time we're growing as quickly as you know, any state in the union, exceeding, I think, everybody but maybe Arizona at that point in percentage terms. But you know, there was an issue of what would happen if you gave UNLV the extra money? And this is what's been told to me from people who are engaged in the university at this point. What if you had a surplus in the budget and you handed over some money to UNLV? What they might do is they might start a med school right then. They might have the resources to begin the seed money to start a med school. And there are people within the state, especially Bill Raggio, a, a former senator who's now deceased, who was not a big fan of the South, not a big fan of our you know, university. And had, I'm not speaking out of school. This guy was pretty much open about that. And one of the things that I've been told from the, the old heads around here that have been watching this and observing it is that he kind of leaned on the regents and said, look, uh, if you want the money that's due the universities, you're going to have to give me some assurance that UNLV can't go ahead and found a med school. And one way to do that is to create a 20-year moratorium, not on med schools, but on all professional programs. So you know, everything from urban planning to uh, new law schools or whatever, we're all at that point you know, banned for 20 years. That seems like a pretty long time horizon. From what I'm told, and this is from Jim Rogers directly, Rogers tried to make it 10 years as a compromise. But uh, 
Mr. Raggio wanted 20 years, and he had an iron fist control over the state legislature at that point. Uh, in 2011, I worked on a project for the state that did the state economic development plan. And uh, I was one of three authors on this. Uh, interestingly enough, it showed uh, a giant deficit in Las Vegas health services. Uh, and you know what's interesting here as well is, right as this report was coming out, the governor got a hold of me and Mark Miro as the two principal authors of this piece. It's another uh, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And he had us sit down and he said, look, you know, cut to the chase. If you had to do one thing in each region, what would it be? And he looked at Mark and Mark said, I would do green tech in, in Reno. And he looked at me and I said, medicine's missing and it's a ton of jobs. You don't have to invent the wheel, you know, or, or invent a new technology. If you just do your own medicine, it would be thousands and thousands of jobs. And this governor wanted jobs. He's like, guys, let me be honest with you. This report looks nice, but tell me about jobs, 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 jobs. I've got to answer to constituents, they're out of work. And I said, medicine is very labor intensive and requires tons of employment. Uh, and it's underperforming because I think we, it's the largest region, I believe, without a medical school in it. And he said instantly, what would it take? I said, well, you know, it's funny. Uh, let me get back to you on that. You know, we'll do a separate analysis. And we end up doing a separate analysis. Because there can be a positive ROI for state tax revenue. Because I saw that in Virginia. And I brought up Virginia at that point. And at, also at this time, in, we wanted to, in the SWOT analysis, you know, the, everyone knows what a SWOT analysis is, right? We're familiar with that acronym out of the strategic planning. Uh, I wanted to have one of the threats be uh, UNL, the fact that we didn't have a UNLV med school. And the then chancellor demanded that it be taken out of a draft of the report that I had put it in. And he said, in effect, there is a med school down there. And what's interesting is I didn't have to go back and forth with them, SRI International who that year everybody was happy because uh, they invented Siri and they all got big bonuses for it. Uh, SR International had a, a staff person who was responsible for their share of the report, Ophelia Young, and she's the one that dealt with Mr. Claych and she's, he's the one that said to her, I, I think there's a med school there. And she said, no, we don't have it in our books that way. LCME doesn't have it. It's not a med school. It was just a clinical outlet. And again, that's important. There's a major distinction there. Also around this time, uh, you have the Nevada Cancer Center is caught up in the, in the Great Recession, so we're in an economic contraction in the early years of this decade. And th the Cancer Center is going to close. And it was built with a lot of philanthropic support, and it had a lot of resources put into it. In fact, it was at the time, and it may still be, the, the state's largest wet lab, which would be you know, good for a med school. And the, the current CEO of... Uh, of MGM and Brian Greenspun uh, got Neil Smatras, the president at that time of UNLV, on the phone. And I was on the conference call. I remember I was in Washington for some reason, and Neil was like, what are you always doing in Washington? Well, I'm at Brookings, Neil. So <laughs> this, this comes up again. Uh, so they're like enthusiastic. You know, Brian Greenspun's like, this would be just terrific. I've got a building up there as well. And Neil was as happy as could be. He's like, man, no one can say no to this. It's pennies on a dollar. They said no. They said no. And when we asked, well, there are people on grants that are finishing uh, cancer research. You know, they'd be appropriate for our biological sciences program, for example. Nope, they're going to have to go over to uh, DRI. You can't have them. So from the very start, there were folks within the leadership of state higher ed in both the uh, administrative offices and in the governing system, and Paul and Bob might want to add to that when he's up here, that from the get-go were like, no way you're doing a UNLV med school. Uh, there was also a point where one of the staff people that works for Dean Schwank up there said in the media, the idea of a UNLV med school is both laughable and preposterous. Not just laughable, <laughs> preposterous and laughable. <laughs> So, you know, th there was a lot of pushback, let's just say, to be polite. And it's a shame because, you know, we're talking about a UNLV med school. That would have been our med school. Now, Roseman has it. They saw it as a chance. And when Roseman wanted to do a med school and they went for first round accreditation, and they're going to have a harder time at it than we are because they're a proprietary school and we're a state university, when they went for it, that's their building. The one thing they had going for them is they had this enormous structure that they bought rather cheaply. And so right now, we'd have a UNLV med school, and it would be in Summerlin. Now, maybe that wouldn't be ideal for a downtown medical district, 
but I'm sure we would take it if that was what was in the offering. And at this same time, I actually hire Maria, and the first thing I say to Maria in 2012 is that, you know, she starts in 2012, but she, you know, she's working about mid-year 2012, September 2012, is we're gonna do a med school. And I'm hiring you because we're gonna do a med school. Go out and find somebody that can do the analysis she found Paul Umba. She said, I looked, I did my due diligence, and she found Paul Umba, and that's how we got associated with Paul. And Maria was the project manager on the original uh, med school report. And the med school report was designed to be an economic development analysis from the beginning because that was the way we were gonna get the med school. That was the way the chamber would be able to frame it. That's the way the legislature would understand it. Quite frankly, that's the way the governor, an enthusiastic supporter of this idea from the get-go, was willing to take it as a stimulus. You know, great, it would be good to reduce mortality and morbidity rates in Southern Nevada, but tell me how many jobs you're gonna get out of this. And the, the good news for medicine is lots of jobs and lots of economic stimulus come out of it. Jay Wan later on is gonna show the numbers that we've you know, added to and, and uh, worked off of some of what Paul's done previously by showing even greater detail of how much economic impact this will have. So, you know, from the, from the start, this was important. Uh, and from the start, as soon as Paul started to do interviews within the state, he was told this was, quote, illegal research. Uh, there was a, uh, at the time, uh, the one person among the regions that was most enthusiastic from the med school was Mark DeBrava, who was the head of the Health Sciences Committee. He spoke too favorably of the med school and got yanked as the head of the med sciences committee and replaced by a lawyer, because lawyers know more than physicians about medicine. Everybody knows that. You can't know a field till you sue it. And uh, <laughs> so they put a guy who's the, you know, the head of it, uh, James Dean Levitt. By the way, at the, around this time, Levitt gives me a phone call. Bill Brown's in the room. I put it on speaker. Rob, <coughs> yeah, when are you leaving? I'm like, leaving for where? He goes, when are you going back to Washington? Uh, I'm not. What do you mean? Uh, I'm staying. I'm tenured. You seconded my tenure. September 19th, 2009 in Elko. I know because I had to make sure you did that before I resigned my job at Virginia Tech. So you, thank, hey, by the way, thanks for seconding that, by the way. No, I'm tenured, dude. I'm here. I'm here forever. <laughs> you know, like that. Uh, later on, also, the president was like, we, you know, the, uh, the chancellor at that point told me that they were so PO'd at what was going on. And this is, I have a witness, because Brian Greenspan was at the breakfast, that he looked into firing me. And I know they called my school so many times to see if my credentials were intact and that I wasn't faking it. I just showed up one day and pretended I was a PhD, that uh, my school called me and said, we think you might have an issue of identity theft. So many people are checking in. <laughs> you know. And again, luckily, the system lawyers were like, listen, uh, if you fire this guy, he's going to retire on what he's going to sue us for. And then he's going to probably have his friends fund him in something else, and he'll torture you even more directly than he's been doing now. <laughs> well, it's just, you know, the, the interesting thing, in Virginia, they would just let stuff like that go. You know, like, I went and argued this case for sinking the uh, rail under Tyson's Corner. We had this beautiful day over at Virginia DOT. They gave us, like, snacks. They nodded their heads, they smiled and said, okay, but I'm, we're in charge, so. But really interesting ideas, guys, thanks a lot. And nobody got heated, nobody got crazy, nobody was doing illegal research or anything like that. So we also then at this stage in 2014 and 2013 move to put the chamber behind the med school. And we started something, and the first event was actually in January 2013, we started the Southern Nevada Forum, and it was a split between the Chamber and UNLV. And the first time that was held was actually in the uh, Foundation Building, was the first event. And I remember it, because the people participated, and they had to have a quorum from the different uh, uh, city councils, and they had to sign in, and, you know, because it was a public event. So what we did is, at that forum later on, after Paul did his report in 2014, we rolled it out. And I also went to preview that year. And you know, preview Las Vegas is a very large event. And rolled out the idea of the UNLV Med School for, to a large audience. And the business voice did a long article on it. And suddenly, you know, people were, hey, what, could we do this? How much does this cost? You know, uh, we liked the numbers. Uh, the, the chamber had to get a pretty good comfort level on it. They wanted to make sure they weren't going to sort of advocate for something that was unworkable. But based on the frame that we had set, 
and based on Paul's analysis, and based on the experience of virtually every other metropolitan area in the United States, if Roanoke, Virginia could have a med school, I'm just going to throw it out there. Las Vegas could have a med school. Roanoke, Virginia has an airport that was so difficult to fly into, I never flew into it. Because it was, you know, a podunk airport. It doesn't have an NFL franchise. You know, it doesn't have, uh, you know, any of our assets. And it doesn't have our population. And about a million people lived in all of Southwest Virginia collectively over an enormous medical catchment area, as we called it. And, you know, that's how you got to the scale to even warrant a, a modest-sized Virginia Tech Med School in uh, in Roanoke, which is not a big city. It's, you know, but it's a big city for that region. And we are a big city. We are the 29th, 30th largest metro uh, scaled re you know, region as we started this conversation and we've only gone up the chain since. So we're a big metropolitan area. Now, Governor Sandoval, again, somebody who wanted this med school because jobs, 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 liked the analysis, thought the conversation went well, met with the chamber, the chamber pitched him. He's like, got no pushback from me. Well, yeah. Now, he came out with the original numbers in the state of the state, and Barbara knows this, and or certainly the former president of the UNLV knows this, that the regents and the chancellor, the regents in charge of this project, or the leadership of the regents, gave a rather low number to the, the governor. And the interesting thing is the governor in the media threw the regents under the bus. He's like, look, I wanted to fund this thing as much as you guys needed, but uh, you know, I was told a pretty low number and that came from the regents. What am I supposed to do? Say you're making it up? So in, you know, Len Jessup, our departed president, who's now at the Claremont Graduate University, he gets hired in January 2015. Immediately as that state's legislative session ha starts, he's scurrying up there trying to get the plus up money. Now, luckily, we added uh, resources in that cycle, especially uh, we could tax uh, ride share, you know, ride calling, Uber, Lyft. Uh, and that tax, you know, that was tough to get through the legislature. You had a lot of opposition from the taxi cabs and so on. But Mike Roberson, who was the Senate Majority Leader, specifically understood that there should be a budget offset and that could be the extra resources that could go to UNLV. Again, I'll note this, the governor would have put sufficient resources in from the get-go, but he was given numbers that did not sort of equal what would be necessary for us to start in 2017, and that was our aspiration. You know, my suspicion is that there was another med school that was a rival to us that had a better facility and that they had a facility, you know, basically for pennies on a dollar, Roseman. And I suspect that there was an incentive for some folks in other parts of the state, let's just say politely, to slow down our progress to the point where a private med school would get approved by the LCME, and they could say, what are we doing this for? You got an osteopathic college in Toro, you've got now Roseman as an allopathic university, you know, doing medicine. I don't see the niche. I don't see a state this size having this many med schools. But luckily for us, the budget came our way and the accreditation came our way and we're launched and they're not. Of course, we're in deficit for a structure at this point. Uh, but, you know, the, the folks who rooted against us and there were people, this is no joke, people were rooting against this idea. And I know, I don't have to say that through some vicarious sort of exchange with somebody else who said so and so is not happy we're doing a med school. They were in my face over this. And it took a little bit of, you know, stamina on the part of my organization to be able to hang in there and push back and say this is something necessary for this region because the charge that we've had from the beginning was to do good for the region, to do good for Southern Nevada, and to do good for the state. By the way, if you do good for Southern Nevada, you do good for the state because it's most of the state. The inaugural class begins. Uh, philanthropies very, very good to our school and people go in on scholarship, just like they did in Orlando. The state puts 25 million bucks up in anonymous donor matches. And so the school gets 50 million, it gets some more resources to build the medical education building, and this thing looks like it's off to the races. Now, at the same time, <laughs> a year later, our president is getting screamed at by the regents for underfunding the med school. In other words, wow, your uh, fundraising's been anemic. That president in his time here had raised more money for our med school than the entire 50-year history of the UNR med school. Nobody said to the president of UNR, 
you raised less than $5 million for a med school in one year? Okay, we heard you've only raised like 50, 60 million bucks for a med school in one year. You talk about asymmetries. I've never seen anything like that. This guy was doing his job, all right? And if he's such a screw up, why is he running one of the leading graduate schools in the United States right now? Okay, that's what I look at. If he was running South Dakota State Technical and Mechanical Trade College, then maybe you'd have a point. But if the guy's running a Claremont graduate school, it might have been that he had a pretty high skill level and that we misassessed that skill level. And part of the way he got in trouble was he had the audacity of, you know, please, uh, may I have some more? That's what we are. It's Oliver. And we're, you know, the little scamp who's asking for more down here with three quarters of the state's population and 80% of its tax share. For some reason, we have to go begging. By the way, they don't need a lot of philanthropy for those buildings up there at UNR because the state built them all. Lock, stock, and barrel, by the way. So with that, I'll transition into the softer part of my talk. <laughs> it's always rough to wreck a crescendo like that when I had a whole full head of steam going on, but I've been told to relax a little more by the medical specialists, and I want to talk now <laughs> about... Uh, a device, and I'll describe, there's going to be a test later on in the ECMO machine, by the way, and how it works. Because I don't, still have not figured this thing out. I don't know, but, you know, it was very useful. I had a, uh, you know, a, an experience with ECMO this summer. I caught a uh, flu, and I had an arrhythmia, it turned out. And the flu got into my heart and paralyzed my heart muscle. Now, uh, I felt myself fading sufficiently to go seek the, uh, the care of UCLA. And while I was there, the you know, wonderful physicians at UCLA said to me, you're not leaving. We see you as having a, a sort of critical episode in a very short time horizon hangout. So when I went into cardiogenic shock and I had multiple organ failure due to my heart not squeezing, they always talk about the squeeze, it freaks me out now when I think about that that you know, I had an insufficient squeeze to sustain life. They stuck this machine on me for 72 hours, and luckily I wasn't on it that long, and I took to it pretty well. I was eating breakfast, I was on my cell phone, I was planning this conference while this was happening. And uh, you know, it was a lifesaver for me, and the reason it's relevant to our discussion is, of course, what I'm leading to is, yeah, it's at UCLA. It doesn't exist here. It exists in Little Rock. It exists in Birmingham, Alabama. It exists in Jacksonville, Mississippi. It exists in just about anywhere you can think of. But it's not here. That's what I meant by when I said that we're the largest rural market in the United States for medicine, because we've got 2.25 million people. And we don't have a technology that, for adults, there's an ECMO for children, because it began with pediatric care in the first place. This became you know, part of the support system for premature birth. Uh, invented at the University of Michigan, if there's any alum out there. Uh, and, you know, perfected in the last 10 or 15 years for adults. And so it's a relatively new technology, but not unknown. And what does ECMO stand for? Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, you know, whatever. I can't even pronounce it. Uh, the, suffice to say, there's, you know, even a little nice wiki entry on it if you're interested in reading further. But basically, it provides heart and lung capacity for people who can't on their own. And just a, a schematic. I'm sure you're going to all get this down. This is in my talks, always available. This is just how it works. It's to show the complexity of how it takes stuff, it basically takes blood out of you, oxygenates it, and sends it back in. It warms it, so it comes back at your body temperature. It is interesting because it's an expensive technology you know, to buy, but it's even more expensive to manage. I'm just looking online at technicians for this, make a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year just to do the monitoring. They have all kinds of software expertise. This would be a good philanthropic investment in that once you're over the barrier of entry of putting the team together and buying the technology, you end up having it sustain itself through market forces. It ends up being a good technology for you know, something where lots of people need it and it ends up paying its own way. But again, it's a really expensive thing to start and the most expensive part of it to start is literally that it is, um, it's expensive to manage. And somebody can screw it up if they're not trained properly and kill you instantly, pretty much. So you really have to do this thing right. Now, it's a bridge to life. Without it, you basically die. All, we did an analysis. It's outside on those tables out there. The top 30 US metropolitan economies, uh, top US 30 metropolitan areas, other than 
two, I'll give you the other one, and Las Vegas don't have it. Uh, no big secret here. Uh, Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, which hasn't had a medical school and until recently, until recently. And the, you know, the way that, the, the interesting thing is I think Westerners don't understand that the southeastern part of the United States is an extended, countrified city. And if you told somebody in Charlotte they didn't have ECMO, they'd say, yeah, it's in Winston-Salem, it's in Greenville, it's in Columbia. You know, it's a fast ambulance ride away. It's not, you know, an emergency helicopter, medevac, mash unit kind of rescue. It is, you know, something you could get to if you were in distress in a reasonable amount of time on very robustly developed I-85 and all these, you know, main corridors. So there's multiple in the region. Remember also, you know, the football team in the Carolina Panthers. The, the region, it's even a reference to South Carolina. All of this is available to you out of Charlotte because it's the hub of a sort of vast network of cities. By contrast, uh, Las Vegas is three times the distance from Charlotte, from the nearest ECMO, and the furthest of any large region in the U.S. Reno's much closer. Reno's close to Sacramento. So Reno's not as far as we are. So again, we're at risk in that if anything should go wrong, and you needed this immediately. If you weren't fortunate enough to have made an inquiry at UCLA, then have them look you over, then say there's sufficient cause for concern to where that you should be, you know, hanging out for a while. And, and then they watch you sink and immediately hook you up to this thing. If I had been in Las Vegas, it's all over for me. I just needed those hours for my heart to, they said, we're gonna wake it up. They had all these nice, you know, <laughs> metaphors for your dying kid. We're gonna wake it up. But you need the next 72 hours on this machine. And by the way, a lot of people who need this machine are teenagers who have acute respiratory syndrome, and they're young and healthy, and then they're struck by a virus, and if they can just get something relieving them for the next 72 hours, they'll make it. They'll have another 80 years of life after that. But if they don't have somebody do that for them, because they live in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, you know, they live somewhere deep in the Great Plains, or they live somewhere in Alaska, or they live in Las Vegas, then they're at risk. We have pediatric ECMO, uh, and again, it's pretty far away to actual real ECMO as opposed to Charlotte. So, many smaller regions, as I mentioned, have the ECMO machine, and a lot of them are actually the smallest, the biggest city in a small state, like Little Rock, like Omaha, you know, like uh, Birmingham, like Jackson, in that the State University Medical School is located often in the biggest city in a state, even if it's, uh, you know, a modest sized state. So, you know, Albuquerque or Little Rock or Jackson or Tucson, you know, have those kinds of technologies. There's many more, you know, I'm just get, listing a few notable ones that people might know. We're the largest region probably without not just ECMO, but we never really had, and this goes back to the discussion that we had with the state regarding whether or not we did or did not have a medical school here. We most definitely did not have a medical school here. We had a university hospital that was an outlet for a medical school that wasn't all that strong a medical school that was hundreds of miles away. You need an adjacent medical school. Even a small state like, you know, Nebraska, which is much smaller than Nevada in population, can field a decent university medical school at its biggest city like Omaha, which has about 900,000 people, not 2.25 million. So what I did on this little table over here is I show, if you look, you know, places like Indianapolis, not Bloomington, you know, Oklahoma City, get it, not Norman. So what this looks at is who's got ECMO, who's got adult ECMO, What's the main campus? And then what's your biggest metro area where you've got it? Now, sometimes in like Salt Lake, that's the state you, and then that's where the biggest city is. Uh, but there's often the case where it's, you know, Lincoln as opposed to, you know, to Omaha. So it's, you know, it's not in Lincoln. It's in Omaha. It's not in, you know, Norman. It's in Oklahoma City and so on. So you, you get the flavor of this. So I think this explains, just to conclude, I'm on my last two slides and I'll turn it over to Paul Umbach. Since most states do locate their medical school, even if it's a modest size state in their largest market, they end up having this kind of technology. And, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons we don't have it is we've never made that pairing. My sense is if we had made that pairing, and, you know, by the way, you know, we, it's funny, we have a regions board that technically is dominated by the South. Three quarters of the regions come from the South. And at any point, you know, when, when Vegas crossed a million people, 
what should have happened is some school named the University of Nevada Reno Medical School at Las Vegas should have been placed here. And by the way, that would have been great for Reno because they, you know, they're trying to be a Carnegie R1 school. They're the, by the way, the only school in a state above a million people is a land grant with a medical school in the whole country that is not Carnegie R1 currently. They're the singular school in that category. So they would have been R1 because they would have worked off Vegas medicine. And that would have been something that this school could never have done. So Portland State would love to have the medical school at Portland, Oregon. They can't. Because the University of Oregon at Eugene, get this, check it out, built a medical school, not in Eugene. They said, hey, why don't we build it in Portland? And so if Portland went to the state legislature and said, we'd like a medical school, the state legislature's response would be, there's a medical school next to your campus. You just happen to have nothing to do with it. It's run by the University of Oregon. Boo-hoo on you. We, on the other hand, the bad news is that this underperformance in medicine is in part due to the absence of a paired university hospital and a you know, R&D-led university hospital and a, and a med school adjacent to it. The good news for us is we can build that now. That's where we are. It's on a sort of more hopeful note, we can build it now. So to wrap everything, I think the governance decisions have put us at risk. I think that governance decisions that separated the key assets of this medical school that we've had, this, you know, what was, was uh, the Nevada School of Medicine or, the, you know, uh, UN UNSUM or whatever its acronym was, separated its assets miles and miles and miles apart. Uh, by the way, uh, when we wanted to have our med school called the UNLV Med School, the so-called regent, the one that called me on the phone and asked me when I was leaving, wanted it called LOVESUM, Las Vegas School of Medicine. He didn't want our brand on it. You know, he's, he wanted us to be a branch of UNR from the get-go, though. He was never for a UNLV med school until the very end when it was fashionable to be for a UNLV med school because the politics had turned to our advantage and it was convenient to be for the UNLV med school. In 2011, it was hard to be for the UNLV med school. By 2014 and 15, it was, duh, there's going to be a UNLV med school. And the reason is, is that the political establishment in Southern Nevada came to see this as a key deliverable to the Southern region in the legislative session in 2015. Short of that, I think that we wouldn't have a med school to this day. So, you know, a few regions, you know, Mark DeBrava notably was an early advocate for the medical school, but most fought the idea pretty hard. The chancellor, the former chancellor, worked against it actively. And the reason we have this med school is really, I think, first and foremost, people like the governor, people like Mike Roberson, who's running for lieutenant governor now, and I'll give him kudos on that. The legislature, the chamber, and the alienated donors who you know, have been generous with their resources to try to support this med school. And I think a lot more money was about to come to this med school when we had the misfortune of removing our president at an inopportune time. I suspect that you know, I would have been able to go to the media one day and say something to the effect of, you know, look, in a single day, UNLV med school has garnered more philanthropic support than the entire 50-year history of the UNR med school. Was this a good idea or what? And that day was denied because of a circumstances which uh, you know, uh, we can get into in the Q&A more specifically. I'm going to turn it over to Paul now, and he's going to talk about, you know, at, at the end of the day, too, we had a two-stage solution because we ran out of resources, and he's here to evaluate the planning ideas that we've offered so far on the med school. Thank you. Thank you. you know, when, when Rob Lang uh, uh, speaks, you don't follow that. Uh, you just say, uh, thank you very much. I'm Paul Umbach. Um, I'm going to find my slides here. Um, uh, I, I'm the founder of Trip Umbach. It's a private consulting firm in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I guess soon Pittsburgh will be uh, smaller than Las Vegas, uh, as, all, uh, as all metros eventually will be. Uh, I, want, I want to just say that uh, over the, the, the history of our firm, we've had about 3,000 projects, and only 5% of them uh, or so are medical school related, but we seem to be most known for our medical education. And over those uh, 30 years, especially in the last 15 years, uh, we've been able to work with this many uh, MD schools and about the same number in osteopathic medicine. And uh, sadly, um, uh, we don't get to be involved as much with the AAMC. We've been uh, uh, uninvited to their, their conferences and there's an old guard at the AAMC that uh, even though we've been involved with starting in, 
and doing the work for this many MD schools. Many of these are controversial schools. Um, and many of the, the work, a lot of the work we've done has been seen as being uh, uh, probably not in the best interest of existing old style medical schools. I'm stealing a page from Rob here in that it hasn't been an easy road. Some of those like the Carl School in Urbana-Champaign, which is an engineering focused school, was not popular in Chicago. Uh, I remember getting a, a phone call from the head of the association uh, who is a dear friend of mine, uh, Daryl Kirsch. I'd actually done his strategic plan when he was at Penn State Hershey and he, he locked me in a, in a room, uh, his office actually, in their new building and uh, yelled and screamed and said that I had to stop doing medical education <coughs> consulting because I had offended the, the dean at University of Illinois in Chicago. And then he went on, I, I can look at the list here, and I had apparently offended many deans, including <laughs> my clients, uh, the University of Washington. That dean was very offended by work we've done in Idaho and Montana and uh, Washington. And, uh, and oh, yes, yeah, not, not good there in uh, Indiana, starting a medical school in, in Evansville, the state's second largest city. So, um, oh, not, not popular in Tucson, where our next presenter was very not popular there. So I, I bring you this slide just to show that only 5% of our projects uh, over 30 years have, have become pretty controversial because a lot of the places where we go, the first thing we're told, and uh, Julie Shamil is my uh, principal project director, and she was just whispering to me when Rob slide had Charlotte on there. She goes, we got to get in touch with Charlotte. <laughs> and I was like, no, you're killing me. No, no, not Charlotte again. Because when we got involved with Charlotte, <laughs> the word there was that we were uh, sued by uh, the University of North Carolina, uh, UN, UN, UNC, Chapel. UNC Chapel Hill, <laughs> sued. And they said, we're putting Trip on back out of business because you've done a study in Charlotte that says it's the largest city in the country without a medical school. And um, obviously Charlotte and Pittsburgh are about the same population. Uh, Charlotte, uh, NIH research, zero. Pittsburgh, 1.2 billion. Um, I could do my Rob Lang impression, but I won't, because we have <laughs> things to go through. Um, needless to say, uh, it's, been a, it's been a really nice time. And one of the projects that we were the most excited about and Rob did mention, uh, failed to mention one important point. After we did the economic impact study, we were then hired by the Nevada Board of Regents to be their consultant to put together a plan for statewide <coughs> medical education. And it was in, through that process where we work with uh, uh, Dan Claych and we work with the, the legislature, where we we're able to actually uh, come up with the, the plan and Barbara, uh, the, the dean, had, uh, Atkinson, had just come on at, at just the right moment, and we were able to work with this committee. And, and if you know the history, uh, there became a, a plan to not just start a medical school, but to fund a significant uh, medical education building, and it was going to be on the Shadow Lane campus, and it was going to be part of what you're going to hear in the presentation about the, the Las Vegas Medical District, and it was all going to be, be wonderful. Um, so I went away um, for four years, did not come to Las Vegas. I'm here with my new, uh, my, I just got remarried, and my wife came along, and we're going on a helicopter ride tomorrow to the Grand Canyon, and we saw Ka, which is a spectacular show. I give an A-plus just to the stage. I didn't even, you don't even need humans with that show. You just have to watch the stage, and oh, there's humans too, but it's, mostly about the stage. Uh, so we're back, and why are we back? Well, we're back because uh, we were asked um, to look at medical education facilities and to really take a look at the schools around the country where we've been engaged in work and what they did and what their medical education facilities look like and to give some recommendations. That's why we're, we're here today. Um, we looked at uh, 11 medical schools uh, that are new, uh, and we also looked at some of the new facilities at top tier medical schools. Uh, through the research, we uh, looked at financial structures. We looked at all the different kinds of uh, challenges and, and some of the technologies and solutions, really more or less to look at the state of the art of medical education. 
We were hired by the Lindsay Institute. Uh, we also were hired by UNLV. Um, we feel that kind of sometimes to step a, take a step back, one thing that independent researchers like, like us can do, I should have had a slide. I'm an independent researcher. Here's my, my uh, uh, disclaimer. Uh, we looked and we're just given our opinion, just Trip Umbach opinion. We looked around the country. And to do this, we've been having a lot of uh, time. We did uh, partner with a, an architectural firm, uh, SLAM Collaborative, to do some benchmarking data. We've worked uh, pretty extensively over the years with, with co-architects, who's the current architect for firm. Uh, we've worked also with SLAM. Uh, we're kind of Switzerland in that we don't have one uh, design partner. Uh, we believe that we're the only economic design firm in the country. So uh, when it comes to design, we say we're the one and only economic design firm. So when we deal with design firms, uh, we don't say that we're associated with one or another. So they helped us do some benchmarking. Um, one real important thing to start with is there is already a, a school of medicine. One of the things that you will find is you talk to people and read on this, uh, sometimes, um, and I'm kind of looking at Barbara right now, it almost seems like you don't have one. Uh, you, if you read enough and you talk to enough people, you could walk away believing that there isn't a, a medical school and there aren't medical students because it seems like we went back in time to 2015 or 2007 or 2000 or 1960 or whenever the university was formed, in that we're still talking about the medical school as if it happened, but believe me, there is a medical school, and the medical school has 60 students, and it's right now in space within an excellent clinical simulation center, which is nationally known for being a collaborative sim center. And the reason I know about this is that we've done projects around the country where people have said, hey, can you give us an example of a great simulation center, regional center, that has more than one university partner or entity. And we usually, uh, so Jackie, who runs that center, we, she's actually been around the country and has spoken at conferences, and she's, she's appeared at different uh, project sites with us. And we just opened a new uh, medical school uh, facility in Evansville, Indiana, which is a market of about half a million people that now has a four-year medical school. This is in that southern tip of Indiana. And the consulting from your uh, simulation center were very important in, 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 their, in their facility. Um, and I think the other thing you need to keep in mind is that it did meet the initial requirements of the LCME. So the, the, the big question now in front of everybody is, um, do we just go and build a state-of-the-art medical education building, or do we divide it into two projects, a medical school health science library building, which was the initial idea, and there's been, I'm gonna mention that there's been uh, evolution uh, since then, and one of the original plans was to do project one, and then at some point in time, project two. Now, if some point in time, project two was in immediately, that at one's going up, the other one's going up, I think it's a really nice plan because that would give a lot of uh, space for uh, study and library and instruction and library support offices. And if that one was being built at the same time, which is project two, which is the medical teaching and education building, uh, you'd have a real good uh, kind of situation. But what, it, what has happened is, um, as, we move, as we move next, that the proposed uh, collaborative center uh, really uh, needs to have more medical education, we believe, from benchmarking uh, put into that. And while it's really important that it's a collaborative learning environment, while it's super important that it becomes a community uh, facility and that people can come and and, and learn, and while it's not a bad idea at all to have interprofessional education and, um, and collaborative inter, interprofessional, uh, but it has to be a medical school facility. And, uh, and one of the other things about, about the Collaborative Learning Center 
is that it's part of a long range facility plan, but so we had a, a couple of concerns and, and one, of the, one of the concerns we had, and then I'll get into the facility now, which is we have two concerns. The first concern is that if, if you're building something that feels much more like a medical library facility and there isn't right behind it the medical school facility of the future, you run the risk of still having a medical school that can't grow to fulfill its needs for the region and won't be able to have more than the 60 students that it started with, okay? The second concern that, that we have is that if we're looking at the other medical school facilities, and this is my preview to get into the national facility analysis, you, you run the risk of being in a situation where you're behind the eight ball for a long, long time and will probably never catch up to the kind of medical education uh, program that's needed for Las Vegas. So as Rob was saying before, that you started this whole thing behind the curve and this building can be something that can get you really where you need to be, you could actually end up even further behind and maybe even never be able to grow beyond the number of students that you're starting with when you have uh, such a great need for, for a medical education program to have 120 students, 150 students, maybe even someday 180 students, which would really start to fulfill the need. So we looked at uh, benchmarking. We worked with our friends from SLAM and uh, there are a bunch of facilities. Now, as you know, we've been involved with about 22 medical schools. We didn't go to all of them. We went to some of the um, uh, schools mentioned, Virginia Tech, Commonwealth, uh, Western Michigan, uh, Dell is the medical school in Austin, uh, Austin, Orlando, Las Vegas, similar uh, kinds of market sizes, uh, the, the new proposed Kaiser School in California, and, and, the, and the last one there is the Sam Houston, which is a new one in, in Houston. And then we look at some really established top tier schools, Emory, Stanford, Hopkins, Brown, and Duke. And, and what we found is that appro approximately 50,000 square feet is what, is what the, the initial uh, size of medical schools uh, generally, generally have, and then they grow in their second phase. So if I look at the next slide, you'll see that um, pretty much when you're at 60 students per class, uh, this shows the breakdown of uh, building support, administrative student life, sim center, instructional and gross anatomy. And, and for the 60 student medical schools, uh, they're, they're about uh, 75,000 square feet in size. And then usually then, if you look at Arizona or other states that are similar, then they build the second large medical education building. And one of the things that we were struck right away by was if it's only a little bit bigger than what Project One is planned to be, why don't we take a pause, get the donor community and the university re-engaged, in a, not in, a, in an end sheet dialogue uh, or a state legislature dialogue. And, and I can speak to this because I was in the end sheet dialogue uh, for a year. And I was, we, were, we were in the state dialogue for a year getting the approval. Uh, we know those dialogues. We know how they go. We know how to be there. But wouldn't it be great if we're, if we're not that far away? So we then have done interviews with the UN, UN, UNLV School of Medicine, and we've talked to a lot of people about the fact that we're not too far apart in terms of what the donors want to, want to um, fund, what the state can contribute, and what really UNLV needs to have an initial medical education facility that's far greater than just a learning resource center. And a learning resource center is very important and those functions should be in the medical school. But if it's, if it's a learning research center with a little bit of functions of medicine, um, it really relies, it takes the school further back than where it needs to be. Um, and then we did benchmarking on libraries, and libraries are getting smaller. Um, we did an op-ed uh, that, that I, I wrote for, for, for just thought um, provocative 
whatever that is. I'm not a professor, so I can throw out thought uh, provocative things maybe once every 10 years, and that does me good for another 10 years. Uh, we're busy with projects every day. But in that, I, I spoke about the fact that library facilities and library functions are getting smaller as technology has grown. And as you can see, that many of the uh, top medical schools have actually gone through a process of re-looking at how they're using their, their, their library facilities. And, and they're actually being diminished and transformed into active learning and simulation and virtual reality and other advanced technologies. And I think everybody here would agree that we want the top most uh, innovative medical education facility for Las Vegas, not one that is below where, where the others are. So we really feel that in the, you know, we're already a fifth of the way through the 20th, 20th century. Uh, somehow in about, what is it, like 15 months from now, we're in, we're in 2020. Uh, we we, we got to think about the fact that by the time this is built, we'll be almost a fourth of the way through the uh, 20th century, and we, we don't want to be saddled with facilities that aren't at, at the nth degree of where, where we want to go. So we came up with some recommendations, and I want to just say one thing. Um, Julie and I care deeply about the work that's been done here in developing, uh, even having a medical school. My story goes something like this. I arrived in Reno, went to Reno first, and uh, Julie was with me, and we sat down at the dean's office, and we were informed uh, within the first five minutes that we had gotten the wrong idea, that we got bad information. I don't know why you're here. You folks were told that there needs to be a medical school in Las Vegas, and the gentleman said, there is a medical school in Las Vegas. It's been there for 40 years. And I don't know who commissioned you to come up here, but um, I have a meeting in 10 minutes, and you guys should just get on a plane and, and go back to Pittsburgh or wherever you're from. Well, it's been a long road to get to where we are from being told that there was already a medical school, and I had missed it. I, I guess I should have just said, oh, I'm sorry. I probably got bad information, I'll go back to Pittsburgh. But we were pretty intrigued at that point to figure out why we were hired and was there really a medical school in, in Las Vegas? I'd never been to Las Vegas in 50 years of my life and had no real interest in going, so I, we decided that we'd go to Las Vegas next. And, and we did, and we enjoyed it very much. Uh, we did find there was no medical school. Um, <laughs> so, so what, what, what we found a lot of other things, though. Great restaurants and great shows and great things to do and wonderful, wonderful place, but no medical school. Uh, we, we don't believe from talking to donors that they think the state of Nevada has the resources. So under their first recommendation is really a private sector-led approach. And you might say, well, in other states, it didn't need to be this way. In other states, it was public sector-led. Uh, Arizona put so much money in, and you might say, well, you know, but if you look at the most recent medical schools, like the Dell, and like, the, uh, and like a lot of the ones that are coming up right now, their states are not taking the lead. The private sector is taking the lead. And in fact, in the, the last five or six medical schools, it's much more of a private sector-led process than a public sector-led process, okay? And, and so there's little interest um, among the donor community in stepping back and saying to the Board of Regents, go and do a, a building and we trust you, here's, here's half the money or whatever the, the deal is. But in fact, there's a need for the donors uh, to get input how to privately construct the main medical school building. And I'm leaving that open in my recommendations. You might be able to have Project One get a little bit bigger and be the ultimate solution. Or you could, you could also have Project Two, the, the, the second building, be done at the same time. I'm, I'm open to that. Uh, the other thing is to focus Project One on medical education. Uh, while there are many things the university needs, um, and many things that are needed in collaborative learning environments and interprofessional programs, 
Uh, those can be added, uh, we, we believe, but we think that, that really uh, leveraging uh, the, the, the project around medical education is really important. I'd like to, uh, in, in our recommendation, uh, you know, let you look at these other facilities that have built the fully integrated uh, top tier medical education building from the start and then, and then use that as the base to, to grow from. Um, one other thing that we, we said was that if you just go with the state approach, you really miss out on a lot of the new market uh, tax advantages. You miss out on a lot of the incentives that can be done. Uh, there's a lot of social impact bonds. It can be much more of an economic development tool to really uh, think broader than just a university uh, funded uh, uh, building. Uh, so, so we want that to be thought of. And then finally, to have the private sector really look at maybe driving uh, uh, the, the, the second project. And, and, and I know this seems a little bit strange if you're uh, folks that spend your whole life in higher education or in state government or policy, but there's a real movement. Uh, I've been working right now in Chicago, uh, and I've also been working in New York City and in Atlanta on some projects in higher education where um, Georgia Tech right now is building a 450,000 square foot innovation building on its Georgia Tech campus that's privately funded by Portman Company. And we've just gotten through developing and planning the Cornell Tech uh, Bloomberg Center in, in, in New York City. Uh, we've been looking at a lot of these other projects. What's happening is the private sector is partnering with higher ed and developing facilities that, um, that are public-private partnerships. I think the days, uh, I've been in higher education planning for 30 years, where we just say that the same process we use is just going to continue. Uh, I just wanted to open people's eyes to maybe a, a, a different model uh, here uh, to keep the, uh, the private sector engaged and the donor community engaged. I want to just end and say that we're going to do questions and answers when Maria does the, the thing, but I want to do my last disclaimer, uh, and that is that these are just ideas, recommendations from Trip Umbach, from what we've looked at, what we've experienced. Uh, we spend our whole life out with medical education facilities. Uh, I want to thank the folks from UNLV for uh, dialoguing with us and giving us a lot of information, and also from the donor community for their, their help and and giving us their thoughts. And, and uh, we want to uh, just close by saying that the best thing in the future for Las Vegas, for the region, and for uh, the, the state is going to be uh, something that we're going to be really excited about seeing. So um, I will introduce my, my new colleague. Thank you, Paul. We are friends from other times and places. So you are ready to go? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, thank you for everybody for being here on Monday morning again. Uh, I'm impressed by the number. And I'm Jay Wan Lim, and I'm an associate professor here in the School of Public Policy and Leadership. And also I'm serving as a senior fellow at Brookings Mountain West and Lynch Institute. You heard a lot of histories and future plans and recommendations, those are all good. And now I can entertain you with some numbers. If you'd like to hear about the numbers, well, let's see. Well, first of all, I'm a regional economist, and I've been working for the issues like sustainable regional growth, economic growth. Well, as you can see, I mean, I joined UNLB six years ago, 2012. Well, when I first moved here, everybody was talking about, oh, there are two areas that are dragging our regional growth, sustainable growth, public education, and medical services. Now, we're talking about the marriage or nexus of those two medical school through the education system. And I think now we can discuss this and more importantly for the future growth plan because we now have medical school here at UNLV. Well, I'll share some of those uh, scenarios like baseline scenarios, what if we match the other metros, but basically, wow, if we don't, if we could not successfully launch this UNLV medical school, I would not be here for, to discuss all those future plans. 
So I think this is great timing for us to look forward how we can further grow or maximize the return on investment and fully build out what would be the impact for not only for university, but also more for the region and how we can meet the growing demand of medical services and is there any tax returns and those type of stuff. So that's why I'm here to discuss some of those. And the first step I did was I developed the growth scenarios. What if we matches the growth pattern of some other comparable metros across the United States? And I estimated the economy and tax return impact under the different types of growing medical industry and growing scenarios for the uh, Las Vegas metro. So let's start with how I started to, how we started to uh, find some of those comparable metros across the US. First of all, based on the population size, market size, and industrial composition, and geographic proximity. Well, for instance, like uh, these are the five initial list of the metros we started with, Denver, Kansas City, Orlando, Phoenix, and Tucson. So in the end, we chose two most plausible and matchable, and one is Orlando and the other one is uh, Kansas City. Well, there are many industrial sectors in, based on the North American industrial classification systems, but we'll mainly focus on these two industries. Sub-industries, uh, the core industry for the medical industry. Hospitals and uh, ambulatory healthcare services. So let's take a look at where we are in terms of growth pattern since 1990. Well, location quotient is nothing more than the relative share of an industry to the national average. So for instance, like in this specific case, hospital industry here in Las Vegas, is LQ value is about 0.6. That means national average always at one because that's where the nationwide averages. So in other words, well, the good news is it's growing, but we're still lagging behind the national average by 40% when we measure the number of uh, employment for this hospital industry. Well, Tucson, and this is Tucson, and Kansas City are the only two metros among the comparables that has higher share of hospital industry compared to the national average. Well, what is more interesting for me is Kansas City. Look where they were. In early to mid 2000s, they were lagging behind the national average, but they started to pick up again, and now they're over the national average. Well, we need to learn from them what they've done. All right, what about the second core medical industry, ambulatory and healthcare services? Well, this includes a pri private practices and uh, uh, the medical diagnostic laboratories. Well, the news for Las Vegas, again, we are lagging behind the national average about by 20% or better than hospitals. We have a lot of you know, medical laboratories here in Vegas Metro, but still, we're lagging largely behind by the national average by 20%. Well, what about the other comparables? Again, this one, uh, yeah, Phoenix, much bigger metro than us, like a close to 4.5 million, has a larger market size and it shows this type of uh, specialized areas. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce all those five different development scenarios, but in the end, I'm gonna focus on two, Orlando, and Kansas City. In other words, what if we match? We can match the growth pattern of Orlando Metro's medical industry. And what if we can match the growth pattern of Kansas City's medical industry? So I want to start with the map. This is the map showing this Las Vegas medical district. The shaded in red area, that's the current uh, the medical school, medical campus, whereas the shaded in red, those are the proposed medical district around the downtown, I mean, Charleston and near downtown Las Vegas. Okay, my scenario and associated economic impact analysis for relatively short term, because you know, if we go more for like 10 years and 20 years, we have some, you know, the, uh, we cannot 
fully rely upon existing data, but basically I've done one year after we launched the first uh, class in, back in 2016, and three year, 2019, and five year for Las Vegas Metro, which is same as the Clark County boundaries. And of course, Las Vegas Metro is about like 75% of the total economy here in the state of Nevada, about 73, 74% of the total population and mainly focusing on two subcategories, healthcare industries. Again, hospitality and ambulatory medical services. So the baseline for us is when we actually started this newer and concerted investment injected to medical industry. As we know, I said it at 2016 for our own region, but the other comparables like Denver, Kansas City, Orlando, and Phoenix. For example, Orlando, Back in 2009, they studied at the University of Central Florida School of Medicine inaugural class. And whereas in 2005 for Kansas City, Dr. Barbara Atkins, our dean, she took the leadership and then she had served, even previous to that year, she had served as a dean of the uh, medical school at KU. But this is the time they actually started to make a timely investment for R&D and education buildings in Kansas City. So we started with this uh, four different scenarios on top of this baseline scenario. Baseline scenario is what if we could not build a medical school here in Las Vegas? Well, now I'm happy to call it counterfactual scenario because it's no longer a fact. I'm happy to have the medical school here in our metro. So we have three scenarios that I'm focusing on for the rest of my presentation. Well, just simply comparative purpose, I'm gonna make the comparison with what if we could not build? What would have been the situation for the three year after 2016, five year, but where we are? So what is the actual net impact of our school of medicine? and Las Vegas Medical District. All right, so first, uh, this pattern, growth pattern of the employment for the specific industry like hospital industry, starting from 2008. This is the most recent data we could get, 2016. We have about like a slightly over 20,000 employment for the hospital industry here in Las Vegas. And we expect to have about 25,000 hospital jobs by 2020, 2020 if we just fail to launch a new medical school. But we were lucky and we successfully launched our medical school and now we have many different options how to grow it, right? That's why I want to see this growth scenario. So what if we match the growth pattern of Orlando's, like University of Central Florida's medical school and their medical industry, growth pattern of the medical industry. Well, we'll add, we'll be close to 26,000 jobs. What if we follow or match the growth pattern of Kansas City's medical industry? We'll have over 28,000 hospital jobs in contrast to about 25,000. Same story, but for the different industry, ambulatory healthcare industries. Well, as you can see, we have about, the specific year, 2016, we have about 38,000 jobs for ambulatory and healthcare services. Again, this includes private practices and medical diagnostic labs. Well, we were expect to grow to like uh, 44,000 by 2021. But again, as you can see, this net effect, especially it is quite impressive if we follow the Kansas City's growth pattern, right? So now it's time for me to share some of those estimation results in terms, I, I know it's, it can be a boring part, but you know, at the end, I'm gonna wrap up what it all means to us. So whenever we share this economic impact, oh, I'm not an economist, I'm a physical. I'll show you how many jobs will be there, simply. And what is the actual economic impact measured in dollar terms? And what is the tax revenue that can be collected for the state and local government? Those are three keywords that I want you to focus on. All right. 
This is where we were in 2016. Well, those two core medical industries further broken into eight detailed industries. And as you could see, back in 2016, we have over 65,000 total medical jobs among those two core sectors and further broken into these eight industries. And out of those 65 total medical jobs, about one third for hospitals, well, the followed by the Office of Private Physicians, about a quarter of them, and combined this office dentists and other health practitioners, that's about 20%. Okay, this is my first economic impact result baseline standard. What is a baseline standard again? I assume there's no medical school. Well, again, remember I called it counterfactual because this is no longer true. Well, that's the good news for everyone in this room. So we had the estimated economic impact, especially the direct number of jobs, direct meaning those working for the uh, medical industries, was estimated at about 68,000. And that shows about 4% of growth between 20, uh, 2016 and 2017. And the multiplier, multiplier is nothing more than, oh, what is so-called ripple effect? What if we have created this many medical jobs? Do you, can you measure the ripple effect? Does it have any secondary effect? The answer is yes. So the 1.77 multiplier clearly tells us every 100 direct medical jobs that can add additional 77 jobs, which further broken into two parts. The first part is 27 so-called indirect, that's a supplier effect. Well, if you have medical jobs, the medical industry should purchase bandages or some other you know, simple services, and those are direct supply to the medical jobs, medical industry. And what about the additional 50 induced jobs? Well, we create a new job around the medical and supplier industries, right? They need to spend money. They go to barber shop. They need to educate kids. They go to grocery store. They go to you know, pharmacy. Those are all additional so-called induced jobs, also known as income effect. So in other words, every 100 jobs created for the medical, job, medical industry will generate additional 77 jobs in other industrial sectors across our study region. So the total number of jobs initiated or started from the medical industry will be about 120,000. So our total job here in the valley, in Las Vegas Metro, is about one million. So that's not a small number of jobs. Okay, what about the economic impact? Well, the direct economic impact measured for the activities, industry activities of medical service industry is about $9 billion with a multiplier effect of 1.85, same story. It has supplier, income effect, so all together, every $1 million uh, uh, from medical industry generated additional $850,000 effect, economic impact, economic impact for, our in, uh, for our region. Well, this one is quite interesting. The total value added, that's nothing more than how much we contribute to the state economy or the study regional economy, like you know, what is the actual share of the gross regional product, which is also known as GDP, a lot of use, and then it's about 5% of the GDP in Las Vegas Metro is directly from medical industry. That's going up to 9% of the total when we measure all those secondary effects. Okay, well I spend a lot of time for this one slide because I want to tell you what I'm gonna share for the rest of my presentation, but I'm gonna move for, uh, fast forward. So these are our other baseline, baseline scenarios for year three and year five as expected. Yes, it is growing, both in terms of employment, output, but what is, uh, oh, this is another one showing this uh, state and local tax revenue under baseline scenario. So state and local tax revenues for the five years, 
So back in uh, 2017, $109 million directly from the medical industry, the total of $565 million. And that will grow up to $659 million total for year 2021. That's a tax revenue for state and local government. And what is interesting to me is also this one, indirect to direct ratio. In other words, you know, 1.01 and 1044 means 10.4 additional tax revenue from suppliers, not directly from, I mean, that's more than the direct tax revenue from, the, uh, from our medical industry that further grows to 12.7%. Well, okay, this is a real business now. Baseline, we don't even have to pay attention to that because it's no longer true. We're happy and we're all so excited to have this medical school. And we're talking about the future growth. The first scenario that I want to introduce to you is what if we match Orlando's growth pattern? Well, this is relatively conservative. Well, I'd say very conservative. I want to show you some conservative scenario and more like, you know, the next stage where we can move, follow this Kansas City much better outcome with that. So total number of jobs, $74,000, and 74,000 jobs, medical industry, and that shows additional 8,900 medical jobs for 2016 to 19. And the economic impact will be about $18.31 billion total, among which uh, close to $9.9 .9 billion will be from directly uh, medical industry. And, oh, average income for those direct medical jobs are $80,000. We're not just creating any job, we're creating high paying. I'm not talking about the physicians. Anybody who's working in those eight core industries, even office, you know, assistance is all aggregated and average $80,000, that's a big, you know, the high paying jobs in our region. That's why we were able to detect those, uh, the ripple effect and other income effect. All right, this is the number for year three, and there will be additional 1,600, oh, this is the net economic impact. The previous slide is showing the overall economic impact from this total number of jobs. That includes the baseline scenario and the net effect of the uh, School of Medicine. Well, this is only for the net effect. So net effect, economic, effect, uh, economic impact from School of Medicine and uh, Medical District is about like 1,300 employment jobs directly from the medical sector. And that yields about $195, $195 million of economic impact. Yes, that's where we are. And they will yield the additional one to uh, 100, uh, one million dollars will create additional 850,000 dollars for the uh, local economy. They will create a total of 361 million dollars of total economy for a region. Again, this is more, even more impressive. Average labor income for this directly hired net jobs, either School of Medicine or Las Vegas Medical District is $83,000 higher than the previous case in the baseline scenario. Okay, this is for year five, I'm gonna skip it. And basically what I want to show you in this slide is further growing, continuously growing. But again, what I mentioned to you earlier, this is kind of conservative scenario. And this is uh, year five. So additional 1,951 medical jobs, direct jobs, hired by a school of medicine or the, in the Las Vegas Medical District. And of course, you know, the accordingly, this outcome or the output sales total economy impact out measured in dollar terms will further grow And 
And this is the total tax revenue on the scenario two. And this is bigger than the baseline scenario because it adds up to the, uh, the growth pattern and the actual, on top of that, there is an effect impact from School of Medicine and Las Vegas Medical District. And this is again the net tax revenue generated by UNLV School of Medicine and Las Vegas Medical District. For year 2019, it will go up to $12.3 million for state and local government, whereas it will further grow to $16.9 million for state and local government. This is quite impressive. Okay, final scenario that I wanna introduce. What if we match Kansas City's growth pattern? You might ask me, how can you do it? Well, I don't have detailed plan to achieve that goal, but at least we have our leadership here in this room, Dr. Atkins. You remember, this scenario was built around when Kansas City started to put timely right investment in early to mid 2000s. They invested for R&D facilities, invested for education facilities for the existing KU medical school. And luckily, we have Dr. Atkins here. She can lead this type of future growth. So what I want to show you here is, again, 77,000. Well, I don't go details about the jobs, but what I want to highlight is here. Between 2016 and 2019 is additional 12,000 medical jobs. If we can match the growth pattern of Kansas City's medical growth. And also, the share of the medical industry, local economy, like gross regional product, goes up to 5.4% directly from uh, 5%. And yes, it will further grow in 2019. And this is showing for the net, uh, showing the net effect of economic impact of the medical school and uh, medical district. Remember, it was like slightly over 1,300. What if we follow? or if we matched Orlando's gross pattern. Now it jumped up to over 4,000 direct jobs. In other words, additional 4,300 jobs will be there if we choose the right path, or if we follow the right path to make the further growth. And the uh, total economic impact directly from the medical sector will be about $595 million, and it will total up to $1.1 billion to our economy, including all those additional effects. And labor income will be still, again, over $80,000. And this is the development scenario for different years, year one and year five. And this is a state and local tax return under Scenario four, if we can match the Kansas City's growth pattern. Oh, I'm sorry. So what you could see is like 2017, $8.83 million of tax revenue for the state and local government, which will grow up to $61 million by 2021. That's a huge growth within a relatively short period of time. And this is a slide I want to spend a little bit more time, return on investment. Whenever you make the decision, you need to know what will be the return on your investment, right? So previously, um, Paul estimated the actual investment for the state funding investment, 30, $31.6 million. And these are the estimated tax revenue. And this one is total economic impact. Under the scenario two, if we match the Orlando's, well, every one dollar of investment will generate 46 cents of tax revenue. But if we follow, or if we match the Kansas City's pattern, it will be more than one dollar and 50 cents. And likewise, you can find a similar pattern for this economic impact. Every dollar of investment will generate $7.33 uh, $7 of economic impact, whereas if we match 
the Kansas City schools pattern will be much bigger. So it shows the wide range of options for us. So this is my last slide. I want to wrap up my presentation by reminding you of some of those facts proven by the numbers and estimation. Well, you know this School of Medicine? Yes, we will stimulate health services growth pattern very rapidly. Well, Orlando, yes, it's conservative, but as comparable to Las Vegas medical industry, but what is more impressive was Kansas City. Well, that's the best development scenario. If we can match the Kansas City's growth pattern, and of course, with a timely investment to maximize the return and fully built out our capacity to meet the growing demands. And again, the decision is ours. And the net effect of medical district and UNLV School of Medicine was producing, uh, it is estimated to produce the higher wage jobs and through the secondary effect of the overall impact to our economy is big. And also we could confirm the strong return on investment both for economic impacts and state and local tax revenues. So again, we have a wide variety of options and it depends on us how to act and what growth pattern we follow. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for your attention. We're gonna have our speakers grab a chair up on the stage and Maria Chagog is gonna grill them with a couple questions, but then we're gonna turn to you in the audience. Hopefully you might have a question or two, I'm guessing, after all this information has been presented. So please be thinking of those and I'll be around to get your questions so we can get them for the recording. Maria? Thank you, Bill. It is bright up here. <laughs> Every, everybody else has been up here but me, so now I'm like, oh, it's like the beach, and it was so cold before. <laughs> well, I was cold. <coughs> I'd like to thank everybody for your great presentations. I took a couple of notes, and so I have a couple quick questions, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Um, we ask that you keep your questions, your responses to the questions kind of quick, so that we can spend some time with the audience. My first one is for Rob. Does the UNLV um, School of Medicine need donors for the medical school? Oh, most definitely. We don't, the states, as Paul was saying, you know, states are withdrawing from this. They'll participate and they shouldn't lead because they require all kinds of constraints on your actions. Like it's hard to do new market tax credits. If the state takes over a project, the state can't be the applicant for that because it has, you know, a deep pocketed resources, you know, your state. Uh, if, it's, if it's led by a nonprofit, if it's led by some kind of you know, uh, NGO that's local, uh, you, can, you can ask for that kind of resources so that you can leverage the private sector money that's in there. But without a doubt, you d we don't have enough resources in the state to do it. And besides, we're not UNR. If we, were, if we just changed our name for a week to UNR, we'd have a gold-plated <laughs> building. Okay. Which kind of answers my part B of that question was, how was UNR's med school? campus and infrastructure supported and built. When they put a name on a building at UNR, it's, a, it's usually a rather modest donation gets a name. It's a great place. If you're a donor, it's wonderful because you could put a very modest share in. You know, for example, there's nothing at UNR equivalent to Greenspun Hall. So Greenspun Hall had a giant contribution from the Greenspun family and it's housing things like public administration, social work, criminal justice. There's no building at UNR that's got those kinds of programs in it that's privately funded. Or there's cases where at Nevada State, the students pay for not just the student center, which typically comes out of student fees, they've been paying for all the buildings there out of, out of student fees. UNR got its seventh engineering building. It said it was gonna match it with a donor. Now they're turning around and weaseling out of it and saying, oh, we're gonna do part of that in student fees, we're gonna do this, we're gonna bond part of it, and they got 40 something million bucks they still got more than our med school for, it, for another engineering building. And by the way, we match them in engineering, the US News and World Report. They ain't nothing special. They ain't no Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech in, medicine, in, uh, in engineering. So 
I found your story about, I mean, we've heard about the ECMO, and I, f I found it very interesting. What would it take to get an adult ECMO machine here in Southern Nevada? A donor would have to put in, you know, upwards to a mill. The, th the key thing is that you need the weeks of training, and the, I mean the months of training, and the staff and the, the, the faculty hires around the machinery. The machinery itself is expensive, but it's not as expensive as that. After that, it could be self-sustaining. And then if, if somebody's life is saved, you know, you can look at the plaque on the wall and the parents could write, you know, if a 17-year-old kid comes in with acute respiratory syndrome, you know, a nice letter to the, to the donor, you know, you're gonna, it's a gift that keeps on giving because it gives life. People won't die who would have died. Thank you. So now I'm gonna go to Paul. Hey, Pa. <laughs> um, from, what I've, from what I heard you say, it sounds like um, between Part A and Part B, is there one that has more importance that we really need to speed ahead on? And if you had a choice, which one would we do first? Well, I think uh, we need a strong signature medical education building as soon as possible to allow the school to go further and faster uh, to support the needs of the region. Uh, I, I'd like to, instead of dividing them into to have an initial facility be 75,000 square feet with all of the things you need for medical education, and then make the second facility even broader and deeper to allow more students and to do more of the interprofessional uh, community collaboration. And I would even, it's in my report, uh, add some clinical space as well uh, so that the faculty practice has even more opportunity to see patients. If you look at your dental school, it's a great model. It has a very strong patient focus and it serves the needs of uh, Las Vegas like really no other dental school in the country. And I think the medical school could follow that with, a, with a more, more uh, space in its, uh, in its final facility. You emphasize the idea, in one of your slides, you emphasize the idea the library, actually square footage for libraries is going down. Mm -hmm. What then, um, how could we be state of the art and cutting edge and creating that shared space? Well, I feel that what's happening nowadays is that we need collaboration uh, from the time education begins until uh, throughout your whole life. And the idea that we need quiet, study space, although I'm not saying there's anything wrong with quiet study space, but to program that much uh, facility. What we're finding uh, from our research is that students are doing that throughout their day uh, in and out of the medical education facilities at home and, and in different uh, locations. And that what we really need when you're in the medical education environment is that uh, interaction space, that small group study space, that active learning space, and the LCME, as we've done a review of, of their interests now and in the future, are looking at not putting folks in study cubes, but putting folks in active learning environments. Um, I've toured now probably 20 uh, medical schools uh, in my, in my uh, career, and we're just not seeing the spaces going to more traditional learning. We're going into much more virtual reality. Uh, if you want to look at a really innovative uh, program, uh, Omaha, uh, Nebraska, the University of Nebraska uh, has some of the most advanced uh, uh, medical education learning labs in the world. Um, and it's a market quite half as big, uh, but it's a, a market that's being well served by its uh, uh, medical school. So I would look at that one as a, as a, a, a benchmark. Thank you. J1. Does the UNLV Medical School need to be fully built to produce the positive tax ROI for the state? Oh yeah, definitely. As you could see, I didn't share all different scenarios, but all the other scenario, re estimation results from the scenario will be available through the brief. But we have many different options, because that's why, that's the beauty of this scenario analysis. We don't know where we're heading to. But as I highlighted in the case of Kansas City, if we can fully max out the, I mean, if we intend to fully max out the return on investment, we should make the timely and right decision for investment so that we can get the most out of it. So that estimation result, we, whenever we do this type of economic impact study, we started from the neutral zone, we don't know where we'll get, but under the different types of scenarios that we developed, I was clearly, I was clearly able to tell, you know, 
this will, if it match the gross pattern of the Kansas City, they will fully maximize the return on investment as well. Is there a time point certain where it's like, okay, if we're not here, we're gonna fall behind and we'll start having, we won't have the potential to reach the full, but we'll lose potential. Well, I think, you know, for the first few years, it will take more investment period than having return. It's not, you know, oh, I make an investment this year and I should have the full maximized return next year. But it, there is always a time lag, but it should be steady, but you know, the fully maximized investment on the timely man, in a timely manner because, you know, that will eventually uh, uh, the max out the return on our investment. Because we should, remember, this is not just a tax revenue and economic impact. We're building facilities for education and R&D. This is close linked to the UNLV's, you know, the top tier mission as well. And I'm an economist and most of this ripple effect is mainly for the economic you know, perspective, but we have other positive return on this investment that we should not forget. Thank you. I now want to open up the questions to the audience. As soon as my microphone works. Yeah. Uh, anybody here before I wander off? I'll be right back. <laughs> if I could ask that you introduce yourself, and as always, if you could keep your question in the form of a question, that would be helpful. <laughs> Uh, so good morning. My name is David Fromer. I'm the executive director of Planning Construction here. Uh, Paul, we had a chance to visit via the phone. My question is directed to you about these notions of uh, or concepts or practices of public-private partnerships. Can you talk a little bit about how you've seen them structured at other universities in terms of public funding versus private funding and how they work? Uh, not only for the development, but if you have any examples of the ongoing operations as well, how these things operate over time with public and private participation of some sort. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. And it was nice to uh, interface with, with you and your team as well. I think what's happened um, over time in higher education is just there's less resources uh, that states have to invest. And I feel that the private sector uh, and the donor community uh, are all very interested in, in filling that gap, but they want to have an opportunity uh, to have more participation and say. So I think a lot of this started at universities that wanted to develop um, a signature building or a program, uh, and it's very similar to the situation we're in. And a lot of folks, when I talk about it, they think that one's going to have all the control and then they're gonna have none of the control, and one's gonna have none of the control, and then they're gonna have all the control. But actually, if you look at uh, Georgia Tech with the CODA building as an example, uh, there's quite a lot of, uh, of balance between what Georgia Tech wants, and, and in your case, what UNLV would want, would be very well spelled out that we would want the following uh, the programs to be developed, we would want the following investments to be made, uh, the specifications, and in fact, in the New York City example, the, the folks that run the Cornell Tech, they had the specifications down to the height of the grass, the materials on the building, uh, everything was so down to detail, who would do the landscaping and who would control the whole campus look and feel. So it's not like there isn't uh, that. The second part is the money part, which means that uh, there is an opportunity for the investment community to participate in uh, the, the value of, of the building and the, and the leasehold Im improvements. Um, and typically, if you look at a history of this, there's uh, generally a period of about 20 years where the private sector holds the facility and then it's usually uh, ballooned or donated back. So, uh, the state, uh, in most cases, state universities uh, receive these buildings after about 20 years. Um, there's also opportunity that, that Rob had mentioned for all the different development credits that exist, which lower the cost or make for the same cost a bigger facility. And then the third piece is the opportunity for these facilities, like the CODA building, to also have private uses to in attract industry, 
uh, institutes, uh, and all the different commercial spin-offs. So I'm working right now at the University of Illinois uh, system, and they're looking at, and I, I didn't realize that's where you went, at Urbana-Champaign. I'm I, you, I, friends there. Um, but what I found was that you open up this facility in a much more easy and, and streamlined way for investment from the private sector. So companies that want to incubate, uh, it's very difficult for companies to work with state-owned operated facilities. And when they want to have shares of the uh, revenue or if they want to have licensure or, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult. So they generally don't go to university facilities, they go to private facilities. And I feel that this model of having a, a, a larger ecosystem facility as your project two uh, could really fuel the growth we want, but not take away from what your office would, would mandate for the standards that you have. Hope that's helpful. Paul, real quick, that, isn't that also what like the University of South Carolina did recently yes. that you worked with them to expand to include more public-private partnership? Right, and that's in, in uh, Columbia. Uh, we were able to do that. There are several other models coming online where that whole innovation ecosystem is we're not separating anymore like we used to. That's the medical school facility. That's this, that's this. And private sector, well, I guess you'll grow up somewhere. There's much more of a, of a plan for that, so. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Barbara Atkinson. I think most people know me. Um, I have two questions. I'll ask one first, because it's for Dr. Lynn. Uh, and it's a comment as well. I was really pleased, obviously, to see Kansas City doing so well, and, and the provost may have some comments. We just discussed a, an issue that might be driving why it's taken longer in Orlando um, to, to build to where Kansas City did. But I, I actually think, and I'm anxious to see if you agree with me, that this could be an even riper uh, market than Kansas City. The problem in every other big city in the country is finding enough patients. You have to steal from other hospitals and steal from other practices. That is not the problem in Las <laughs> Vegas. That is it's a huge asset to this community. We'll steal from, I hope, UCLA and sure. Arizona and Texas. They hope so too. They hope <laughs> well, they, they may because they don't have they enough don't have people. Any space for us. Yeah, and we really need to do that, steal from there, but mostly just plain build the practice that isn't being seen at all. So I, I think it's a big opportunity. Oh yeah, definitely. Because you know, as Rob mentioned earlier t today, we passed the Kansas City in terms of population size. Mm -hmm. Now we are 28th, and we are one of the, still one of the fastest growing metro in the nation. Mm -hmm. Well, Clark County, for instance, like in two years in a row, 2017 and 16, second fastest growing, you know, county in the nation. And we all know that. We don't have relevant type of specialist. We don't have relevant type of medical services locally provided. And as is the case with ACMO, he had to travel to UCLA. And for instance, like I did some sort of surgery with my giant cell tumor in my TBA bone, they have to sell it and send it over to the UCLA pathology lab to get the results. I had to wait two weeks to get that. Well, I think what is interesting is, yes, you're right. You touched a very important fact, how we are, we can differentiate it. We don't have to worry about competing with the other hospitals. But going back to Paul's previous point, because you know, you, uh, University of Illinois is newly proposed medical school. Mm -hmm. Well, I studied there. And the Carl Hospital is the hospital where my daughter was born. Okay. It's a small hospital, relatively. Yeah. And the total population in the metro is less than 200,000. Yeah. Well, they had to come up with a different plan. They had to come up with more innovative approach. Mm -hmm. Their College of Engineering is one of the strongest mm -hmm. in the nation. So I think you know, they try to couple it with how they can specialize the new direction of the medical school. But I think, you know, we don't have that internal resources yet, but once we have this big enough medical school to serve the needs of the local patients and the 
And we have a great potential to go together with the College of Engineering and other, you know, the grant money, R&Ds. So I think you know, we should start from that direction, but we'll have a ripple effect for other educational opportunities and R&D opportunities here in the campus. I was also going to comment on, on what I think the economic factors were that really made the changes happen in Kansas, and it was buildings. Um, we added a research building first. It was uh, about a $100 million research building. We could hire faculty to do that. We could go to add NIH grants. That was a huge driver. The next thing we did was a, a, a tech transfer kind of a building. Um, that could have uh, entrepreneurs in it starting new businesses. We actually ended up with two of, two of those, and we have space to add those kind of things here in Las Vegas as well. And then we then was added uh, clinical research for cancer building, so an outpatient clinical research building funded by taxes um, in Johnson County a very rich county near Kansas City. And the last one that happened uh, after I left, but was in the process before, was the medical education building. So it was the, the follow-on, but we already had a medical education. And in combination with all of that, they went from 175 students to class to what I think is 232 now. They added full four-year uh, school in Wichita rather than just a three-year school and a four-year school in Salina, but also added to the main, the main thing. So I think that whole economic spectrum across the, the is what added to it. That's actually what it took to, to build it. Can I ask my other question that actually is yeah. Paul? <laughs> I mean, the economics is really important in this yeah. whole thing. And it was clearly important at the start of it, and it's clearly important now. But I want to talk about the thinking about how we grow the whole school. And it's really the what, what's the next step, what we have to have. So right now, just to be clear, what we have at Shadow Lane is 22,000 square feet. It's not really enough for 60 students, although don't ever quote me when no. the LCAM no. comes to visit. Oh, it's plenty. It's plenty. <laughs> All right. It's well, enough. it's barely it's enough, enough <laughs> and we're actually adding some in our clinical space because we already know we need another large um, lecture hall. Yeah. Um, it's just not enough, and you showed that. It, 50,000 is minimum and we really need 75. Yeah. The question is, what could we live with if we had what we have now plus more? Mm -hmm. and, and what the more should be, and it should be all of the space that we've outlined, I think. What we've outlined in this plan, which is the library that would be other students because we don't want three mm -hmm. sets of librarians. Right. We, um, a dental school library is not different from a medical school mm -hmm. library. It's all the same thing, a little less of some and a little more of some. But anyway, we, we need that. We need the classroom for sure, and that, that's the piece we're missing. Yeah. Um, could we go up to more than 60 students with another 50,000 square feet? Not. I mean, it, what, what we really need is to get to that 120 students and ultimately 180 students. So yeah. to me, we need enough to get by with us now. If we can do two buildings together, whatever they are, that's what I'd like to see happen. Then we really can get right away to 120. Mm -hmm. And we would put office space for faculty in the building in yeah. temporary space, build it out later, move the faculty to an to a office building their faculty office and um, build it out later for the 180 students. I don't think, I think we can build pretty fast into 180, but it'll take probably mm -hmm. 10 years more than the building is built to get there. And I, I, that to me is, is the best plan, but mm -hmm. I, I heard you and in, in your um, approach to it and, and we'll need to think about that um, right. as well. Yeah, well. It, yeah, I just want to comment and say, first of all, I moved to Kansas City in the last year. I got married, remarried, and I can walk to, uh, not quite, I live in the Country Club Plaza area. I can walk uh, to, to the medical school there. Uh, I want to just say that 
I think some of my thinking comes from a bolder strategy that I, th I know that you share. And while, yes, you have 22,000 square feet, and while it would be nice to piece together for a period of time another 50,000 square feet to get to the 75 um, and to have it in, in different places, uh, I, I just feel that this is the time, and if the donor community and the private sector could participate, uh, that, that from, from what I've been researching, that you could move to that uh, larger signature building, and you might say, well, we're only gonna get 25 million from the state, and how would you get to that with only 25 million from the state? And I think to engage in more planning between now and the legislative uh, period in February gives us an opportunity with the right plan to, to re-engage with the new governor who's gonna be in, in the legislature to say, for a little more than we were talking, here's, here's a way that we can get to really make that, that move and have then enough space uh, in building one uh, and, and then building two at the same time for all of the, the needs for the future and do it all at once. And, and I, the only reason I come, came up with this was I remember working with the Colorado uh, school, um, uh, Dick, I forget his last name, who was the dean there, and he told me an important story. He says when they took over the old uh, airport and the, uh, there was a military BRAC project, BRAC is where the military gives space, um, they said that they had 30 years of buildings to build. And there were two philosophies in Denver at the time, and I was involved, we were involved, and the first philosophy was, let's build it incrementally over 30 years. And the second philosophy was, in five years, we're gonna build out the whole campus. Well, if you go to the Denver folks today and you ask them, what was the better choice? They would tell you that building that out, 30 years of buildings in five years was better. Because here's my, now I've just put it all out there for everybody in the audience. I'm always nervous when I hear about building one and building two, and it's because building twos sometimes don't happen. And because of the experience I had in Nevada uh, four or five years ago, uh, I think you, you, have a, you need a bold strategy to get as much as you can and get this thing nailed down the way it matches your vision and the vision of the university and not take the risk that the building two never happens. There's also a risk with donors. If donors don't believe that we're moving in the right direction, if they're gonna carry a lot of the weight for building two, and they're not even happy about building one, you run the risk of the donor saying, I'm not even happy about building one, why am I gonna now have to be in building two? And I feel that working with university facilities and working with others, we can come up with, uh, I believe, a, a plan that gets you further ahead than you, you would be, and that Denver model, it's hard to beat. Uh, now, how they did that, well, that's another whole story, but. Um, can, I, can I just add to that? In a few weeks, we're gonna have a new governor. Governors love med schools. That's why Governor Sandoval loved it as well. And one of the things you can do, and this is the largest region in the state, in either party, it doesn't matter who wins the election on this, is do good in the biggest region and get credit for it. And you're actually fixing something that's gone sort of sideways. And you could, either governor could come in and say, you know, this thing, you know, was kind of turning into something weird. And then I showed my leadership and I put my arms around it. We're gonna get a med school there and it's gonna be the one we wanted. We're not gonna have to go with some multi-staging, multi-process, you know. And we just don't know that yet. I mean, we, and what we should have ready by February and what I wanna you know, have in place is what would, the, what would that plan look like to get it done on national comparables for an ambitious building, not way over the top ambitious, but credibly ambitious. And I think, I think we can do that. I don't think we have to you know, rush this. We're, remember, we're fortunate. We're right up against the next legislative session. We're right up against the next election. It's a change in governors, so there's an opportunity for somebody to put a sort of a fresh face on this thing. And I, I, don't think, I don't think we can lose with either candidate as the next governor. I think both of them would have an incentive to nail this thing down. 
Ah, the mic is here. <laughs> Surprise. Um, you can't see we're blinded. No, we really can't. Ah, okay, so you won't know who's asking the question. <laughs> Diane Chase, um, Provost. I wanted to piggyback on the first part of, of the Dean's uh, question. Um, most of you know I come here from UCF, uh, and so did get to see the development of that College of Medicine. But there is really one distinctive difference between, I would say, Orlando and Kansas City and Las Vegas, in that the school in Orlando was built in a place that really had no people. So Lake Nona was a grand experiment to build an entire medical community in a place where nothing existed before. So I do believe that one of the reasons why Orlando is not yet at that steep incline is because all of the infrastructure and all the housing, et cetera, was not yet in place. So I think it will be a tremendous impact long term, but it's not quite there. I think Las Vegas um, can move faster. So my question is, do you think that that's the case? Well, I think so, for a couple of reasons. As you pointed out clearly, our Medical campus is located in right next to the proposed uh, Las Vegas Medical District. I drop my kids all the time to the Hyde Park Middle School there, and at the corner I see the new construction, Everyday Optum Cancer Center, and I'm talking about this ecosystem. Well, I think the physical location of the medical school is extremely important because I mentioned the supplier, but also I talked about the other industry, which is ambulatory medical services. The pri private practitioners like to locate near to the big medical school and hospitals, of course, we all know that. And even some other, you know, the medical diagnostic labs, and the, it's growing. So depending on where you put your new medical school, how you can build geographically proximate ecosystem around the core medical services and also it's close enough to most of our you know 2.3 million of population have easy access to it with the new when once this spaghetti ball is completed right so this accessibility mm -hmm. within medical industry or other supporting industry and from the patient's perspective, these are all extremely important. I think we made the right decision where to put it now. As you pointed out, it's a whole lot different story from the Orlando's choice. Yes. Hi, uh, Dr. Elisa Palmer, the Chair of Family Medicine at the new UNLV School of Medicine, having been previously Chair of Family Medicine at the UNR School of Medicine here since 2006. I want to thank you for bringing up that aggressive plan because I would be in support of something over the next, a five-year plan. I mean, a really speedy plan to do something. We've been talking about this for many years. I'd like to pose a question, though. For all the data that was presented, especially the return on investment, is there any impact or change that has because of Toro already being here and well established or with the fact that Roseman is applying uh, again for getting um, their medical school started and how might that impact any of the data or will it have no impact at all? Well, as you could see from my baseline scenario, the Toro and Roseman had been here before we start this medical school. So it's relatively new, you're right, but at the same time, we have averaged the past growth pattern. And yes, it is still growing, but you know, a lot of those uh, growth, even without the full medical school, reflects that the growing needs of our community for the medical services. So that's a market response, I think. You know, and we're putting the right type of investment through the UNLV Medical School. We can more proactively respond to the growing needs and all those uh, R&D and some other additional uh, the educational and also R&D activities through the university system. I certainly understand that. My concern is if Roseman to have a, a very aggressive plan once they potentially get accredited, that may impact UNLV School of Medicine if we don't have as aggressive a plan. Well, I don't think that's not necessarily my question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, first off, the region is so depleted of right. medical services at two-thirds the expected output, and it's, it remains there, that you could have a lot of players because it's a relatively large region. Omaha's got two medical schools. Mm -hmm. It's got 900,000 people. Yeah. We should be exporting medicine to the local markets around us. Yeah, I want to also mention that Kansas City 
uh, where, where I now live. I didn't know Kansas City would be the, the topic of the day, but it is. Usually it's not, but it is. Um, it has three medical schools. There's an osteopathic school that's 100 years old. Uh, the University of Missouri has a small medical school in, in Kansas City. Uh, and then, of course, there's the KU School of Medicine that's gone through dramatic uh, uh, growth. And you might think, well, wasn't one in Kansas and one in Missouri? Well, um, Barbara's school is at mile marker one foot. It, uh, it's right there on state line. And when you're in Kansas City, you don't know if you're in one state or the other, except this little road called State Line. I live two blocks from State Line. I can see Kansas from my backyard. So when we're looking at regional economics, you're looking at really all the players. And if you look at when you're at uh, 0.7 on, on the scale of uh, uh, depletion from uh, the location quotient or whatever your numbers are, there needs to be other players, and more players build more energy and more growth. So if you look at the Houston Medical Center, in that medical center, there are three medical schools. Uh, now we're adding uh, University of Houston to that. We're adding Sam Houston to that. And you're probably thinking, well, will that uh, hurt that medical environment? Actually, it, it will just add more fuel to that fire. Down the road, though, this is, I think, really, really important. The state's medical school has to be the leader. And the reason why it has to be the leader is if you look at history, those extra things that the private sector or the DO schools or the private for-profits won't ever invest in because they need an immediate return won't be in place. So I would say that the, the machine that, that saved Rob's life would still not be there if uh, Toro uh, or Roseman got a medical school because it's those extra investments in technology that you only see in the Denvers, the Omahas, uh, the Kansas Cities. Uh, it's just the way the model works. So I hope that's helpful. It is. And I know those of us who are in medicine understand this, and you all understand that, but I think the public, our legislators, and potential donors may not understand that. And so I think it's important that we communicate the message just yes. like you have today. Thank you. And can I just add one thing here? St. George, Utah is booming. They go to Salt Lake. They're closer to us. They go to Salt Lake because if they needed ECMO, they'd have to go to Salt Lake for it. Kingman would have to go to, to Phoenix. You're actually putting the region at risk in an extended sense, too. There's going to be three, 400,000 people at mid-century in southwest Utah. And they're a pretty quick drive down to us. So the market we're talking about is mid-21st century. So you're building this facility. As you said, it'll be completed at the quarter mark in the century. By the midpoint in the century, you're looking at a region of 3.6, 3.7 million people extending up to places like you know, St. George. And you know, there's tons of market demand. And all of that, people are going greater distances to avoid Las Vegas medicine. And I think all three, the osteopathic the private medical school, the public medical school, could all be here, and they'd be telling you they needed bigger buildings. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your report this morning. I am Maggie Farrell. I'm dean of the libraries. Um, we also oversee the two health science library facilities over on Shadow Lane and at 2040. So uh, my concern is how you um, have described libraries as quiet and traditional. I think if you look at how millennials are using modern research libraries, that's just the opposite. If you go by lead library today, quiet is not an adjective that you would use. So um, as we're envisioning the space, we're talking about very interactive, collaborative spaces, ones that support um, education maybe during the day and maybe study at night as a place where already we know that our students are spending about an average of 22 hours um, a week in our facilities. So when we look at our facilities, we're looking at very engaged community spaces. 
um, and not the traditional library that I heard you mention today, um, but spaces that are used for virtual reality and 3D printing that we're already doing. And we need more space to expand that type of learning because knowledge comes in a variety of formats. So I guess my concern is as we speak with legislators in the community and with donors, that um, how um, an older generation might use the term library versus how millennials think of the term library. Millennials think very differently and how they use our spaces and what we do in those spaces as instructional support is very different from even higher education 10 years ago. So as we talk to a different audience, do you have suggestions on how we convey the energy, the learning, and the collaboration that happens today? Yeah, that's a very good point. I enjoyed our conversations on the phone as well. I want to just say that um, I'm not of the millennial generation. I, I happen to be a parent of, of children 20, 22, 25, 26, 27, 28, and uh, a grandfather as of six weeks ago to a, a little, I guess, Generation Z or whatever they're going to be. <laughs> um, I, I so appreciate your, your comments because um, while li traditional library functions everywhere in America have, have uh, changed, the importance of collaborative learning and, and, and connection is, is at an all-time high. And bringing technology into that space is, uh, is critical. The, f the fear that I have is that if we get into limited thinking about we're going to keep the 22,000 and then we're going to add a little bit more and see what we can piece together, uh, it's not going to be good for either the library function, the collaboration function, or the medical education function. There's not enough to do all three. And what I would propose is that we talk about it as a as a um, a medical school collaboration uh, uh, um, you know enterprise, and I think in this uh, next phase of of analysis, keeping you and and folks that that represent the libraries engaged in that is going to be what's really going to be important because I think the bigger fear is we could get into a this or that. Uh, and I think that what we really need and what the donor community wants is a strong medical education facility and, and that has to be up, up front uh, with the other functions being, being part of that. Um, and, and I think that you're exactly right. The average age of the legislature is probably more my age than my kids' age. Uh, we get that. So uh, I think that's a very important point. Uh, my final point I want to make uh, is that uh, messaging is very important and how we uh, describe these concepts is critical to how successful we are. Good morning, Tom Kaplan with Wolfgang Puck Companies. I, I too want to thank all of you for a very insightful conversation and optimistic uh, outlook. It's not a word I use often in this community. Um, at the risk of putting uh, Rob back into another medical event situation, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to. <laughs> I, I think the the bold move of a public. Par private partnership um, and, and measured progress makes makes sense. Um, but I guess either I missed it or I'm not completely clear. How do we uh, push this forward, both in the donor community as well as the business community, with the um, elephant in the north or, and partially in the south and in the Enchi world? I mean, what's going to give the confidence to these communities, if you will, that we can build what we need, but at the same time not have these folks come back and haunt us. Is the, is the new governor, is the legislature going to give us that protection? Well, I think we need to start by building trust again. So everybody in this region has a stake and an interest in seeing a very successful med school. And nobody in Las Vegas is rooting against a med school that has all the components we're talking about here today. Uh, the issue is, as we lost resources because of, uh, you know, a loss of a president, uh, you know, is it enough to build the kind of facility we're talking about? Does that building that mean you don't get a number two because you've pushed, the, you pushed some of the donors out in the process? 
Do you forfeit that? Especially, and this was what really struck me from the beginning. You know, I, I said it before and I'll say it again. We're getting a new governor. And boy, do they, this is catnip to governors. They want to come to the ribbon cutting. And they want to go and get more resources. And the state's not in bad shape. The marijuana taxes came in high. Yeah, you know, the state's not in terrible shape for an enhancement will. to this. Yeah. If you will. If you will. The marijuana taxes are always. The marijuana taxes, if you recall, were placed into a rainy day fund. Right. And they substituted for the rainy day fund. And then they come in higher than they were supposed to. And so there's a decent amount of discretionary resource available in this budget. One of the highest priority for Southern Nevada ought to be this medical school. It's just straight up. So, you know, if you brought the public sector back in, though, you have to be careful because you can't do it in a way where it's run completely by the public sector. And they say, hey, donors, write us a check, send it over, close your eyes, hope for the best. And donors don't believe that's a good course of action. So you're going to have to have a brokered out deal where either you parse out parts of the medical school physical plant and assign it to donors or assign it to whoever who want to build that part of it. Remember, donors have an idea, they have an intent of what they want to build. And if they have one set of expectations and then you come back and say, well, you know, because we lost so much resource, we're going to go ahead and turn around and do this other thing. You're going to, you're going to alienate them in the process. So I'd say with the next governor, with the next legislature, you know, we're only talking about a few months. I don't think we're going to lose the 25 million bucks, not when they gave 46 million bucks for an engineering college at UNR, not when three quarters of the legislation, legislature comes from here. You're, I think you're looking at more resources as this thing gets fixed. And there's a question over there. Yeah, we're going to have one last question. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So I'll, I'm going to just speak on behalf of the donor community that since there is a donor who is tied to this in a way that is, in, is, is being vetted out is very uncomfortable. Um, you're not going to get donors to join, not after seeing what's happened over the last year. So on behalf of the donor community, phase two, no matter how, you, how, many, how much lipstick you put on this pig, it's not going to happen. So if you know that phase one is all you're going to get, how do you do this in a way to encourage someone to say this wasn't a bad idea? I do remember reading in your report that you danced around the idea that if phase one only happens, your accreditation is in jeopardy. So you can't do phase one as it stands because you don't have any guarantees of phase two. Bottom line, can't be done. Don't propose it. If phase one's all you get, it's over. You, you lose your accreditation if that's all you get is this big building with, call it a library, call it a community space, call it whatever you want, it's not a med school, it's anything besides a med school. So the question to you is, if phase one is all that happens, how do you not lose your accreditation? Well, I think it's not, it's accreditation is one of the issues, but I think the real issue is about medical students having the best place to get their education. Uh, you could probably duct tape together enough spaces and do a really nice job at your LCME site visit to say we have everything we need. But if 22,000 square feet are here, if you have 5,000 here, if you, if you take this facility and say, well, really, the medical students are using this part of it, but they're also going to be having another place, I'm not sure that's the kind of environment uh, that I've seen in going around the country at these facilities, including what, what Barbara uh, put in place that then blossomed after her tenure at Kansas. And, and I think that while you don't want to have that, I don't think the community... You won't get the numbers, too. You won't get yeah. J1's economic, you, know, you won't get the impact. You, well, and you won't you also won't have the best environment for, for learning and medical education. I would say that uh, for a, a marginally larger investment and not that much more space, you could achieve all of these, these issues. Uh, and then the, the second building in time would happen. I, I go back to Arizona. I, I don't know if you all know the situation. It was an old high school downtown. It was dilapidated. And when they renovated that building, it got them into the accreditation. It got them where they needed to be. But because of the success of that, they were able to get significant resources for a, one of the best state-of-the-art large-scale medical education buildings. But it's not just for the medical school. It has library function. 
It has tons of other interprofessional programs. It even has uh, some folks from northern Colorado that have a couple programs in there. It is a national model for interprofessional education. But if you didn't have a good A, you're not going to get to B. So, Lindy, I ap appreciate your comment that we have to come up with a better solution that everybody can feel is the best thing possible, and then that sets the stage for more investment. And that's why I support the private sector uh, being in the, at the table with NG and with the university uh, from the very beginning to come up with a, the solution. So. Rob? On that note, thank you. I feel obligated, uh, given our time constraints, to bring the public part of this event to a close. Let me thank our speakers, and let me thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the PowerPoint presentations are up on our website. You can pick up a copy of Paul's uh, fuller brief <laughs> on the way out. And the ECMO report. And, and, really? and ECMO report. <laughs> and we'll have Professor Lim's report up on our website in a few days. So this conversation will continue. Thanks again.